Uh, we love Siskan. We come whenever we can, and we'll never speak at Black Hat Asia. Never. True. I think there's a reason this this is having the best speakers because it shows that uh, all the real researchers are really behind Siskan and Thomas, and we're all speaking here and dropping our new shit here. So, uh, hey, a round of applause for Thomas, Siskan, crew, sponsors, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, most conferences, like we go to a lot of conferences, we give a lot of talks, but 99% of the time we give our talk and then we go hit the pool. But like today and tomorrow, like we're gonna spend a lot of time in here because there's so, the speaking line is so good. I think that says a lot. Yeah. Doing. So yeah, so I guess we'll just get started. So uh, this is like a brand new talk, uh, new research. Uh, last summer we did some, some research on car hacking and then this is sort of the, the second step of it and we spent, I don't know, six, nine months on this. Yeah, so. quite some time. Pretty, pretty cool, hopefully. Uh, and and we, we understand that people in Singapore aren't poor, that there's almost no one poor here. But in the United States, there's a lot of poor people. And so uh, that's what this talk is, is about. It's car hacking for all those poor United States people. Uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll drive for you. All right. So this is us. The, uh, that, that's me, and that's Charlie. I didn't want to be the media whore until I found out the alternative was the douchebag. So I'm happy to be the media whore. So uh, we're going to talk about, first, real quickly, like what it means to attack a car, like especially say remotely. So uh, we, there's a lot of talk about that. So what exactly does it mean? And then we're gonna uh, talk about a little bit about our research. And then finally, we're gonna move into, you know, we got cars from DARPA. So the, the U.S. government was silly enough to give us cars, but not everyone's that lucky. So how how if you want, if you're interested in car research, how do you get started? Uh, you know, without having to pay forty thousand dollars. If you just have you know a couple thousand bucks, can you do car research? And and yes. So that's what we have a white paper we're going to release here uh, and the slides and all this. You should be able to get up and running and, and do all the stuff we're doing. Uh, car hardware for software people. When Charlie and I started this research, we really didn't know anything about cars. I didn't change my own oil. I didn't touch the car other than to drive it. Um, we learned a lot about cars, but we realized there's a lot of things, you know, software hackers uh, need to know before they actually start the automotive research. Yep. All right. Well, you'll see the rest. Yeah. All right, so you want to talk about the yeah. attacking? So, you know, a lot of people just assume that you pop a car, you pop the telematics via, you know, Bluetooth or, or GSM or something like that, but there's kind of this multi-tiered fashion in which you would compromise a vehicle to gain physical control. Uh, the first is getting code execution. Um, I think that's becoming more and more prevalent in vehicles. Not only do you have Bluetooth, you have in-car apps, right? There's all this connectivity, cars have Wi-Fi. They're adding more and more remote vectors onto the vehicle. Cars want to have app stores in them? Like, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. A whole app store because your phone doesn't do that. I don't know, right? Yeah, so the attack service is getting bigger every year with cars. Yeah, and you even have kind of a localized remote uh, attack vector. This is a thing I have at home. Uh, it's Fleet Karma, right? They run over Bluetooth or, or GSM, CDMA. You can plug it into the ODDP2 port and read data out and uh, you know, write data in. So you can, if you have a few quick seconds to physically access someone's automobile, you can plug one of these things in and kind of do the attacks that we showed in our previous research. All right, so you just have to get code running somewhere on the network inside the car, whether you remotely pop it or whether you've somehow plugged something in or you wired something in. Yeah. Just some, at some point, you need code running yeah. somewhere in the car. The goal is to get on the car's network. Uh, once you're on the car's network, what do you do? Uh, you, physically, uh, you, you send CAN messages on the wire, well, twisted pair wire, you'll see later too, uh, and you either do kind of diagnostic messages that a mechanic would use, or you find real messages that the car uses to do things like braking, steering, acceleration. Um, right. You just want to inject CAN messages. Basically, once you're on the network, you want to inject CAN messages to do stuff. Right, and the thing about CAN is that there's no way to tell whether the message is coming from you know, a compromised ECU, an ECU plugged in, or anything, or yeah. the real ECU. So. It's, it's broadcast, there's no authentication or authorization, so they just consume messages, they don't ask where it came from. There's not even source and destination addressing, so you don't even know who sent it or who's supposed to get it. Um, you know, one of the things a lot of people don't think about, well, this is really bad, but there's a gateway uh, a lot of the times too. So there can be. Yeah, there can be a gateway, um, right? So if you pop the telematics unit, it doesn't mean that you'll be able to send messages that'll reach the steering ECU. It may go through some gateway system, so this is something you're gonna have to 
bypass or subvert or reprogram or something like that. And uh, this is just another concept when you're compromising a vehicle. So uh, here's some different things you might hope to, to be able to do. And these are things that we did at least some of. So you can, in some cars, in some situations, you can affect the steering of the car. Uh, this is by sending cam messages. You can make the brakes either you know, lock up or not work. There's a lot of things you can do. You can make the car accelerate. You could turn on the microphone or just screw up with the display. There's lots of things. The, the possibilities are like very wide open once you actually get the ability to inject cam messages into the bus. So, so here's a video of, uh, that, that we, we took this reporter out on the streets of Pittsburgh uh, and, uh, and showed him some of the attacks. So let's see if this, this runs here. I don't know if you can hear the sound. But anyway, so, he, so he's driving along. And then we, we totally crashed him off the road. <laughs> and scared, put the, the fear of God into his cameraman. Uh, but we just smashed him into the side of the road. So um, here, here, here he is stuck. So yeah, so he kind of knew what was going on, but uh, his cameraman had no idea. So, so this is us. So, you, so this is like why car hacking is fun. It's, it's not popping calc. It's, you know, crashing a car into the side of the road. So it was, it was, it was I, Yeah, I think Charlie and I popped calc, you know, enough times where it lost all of its peel and we just physically wanted to start hurting people. Right, so, so now when I get, you know, when I, when I want to go back to the old days, I just open up calc. And then it's like, oh, I remember what that was like. And so anyway, this, is, this was uh, pretty fun to do. Yeah. And dangerous. Yeah. Uh, car hacking's hard. First reason, it's expensive. This is, uh, you know, the bill for the Ford Escape that we bought. We bought this thing used. We bought it in 2013. It was a 2010 model, 20,900 USD. Most people don't have that. The Toyota Prius, even more expensive, almost 32,000 USD. So right there, you have $50,000 in car. Even if you work for a company, it's hard to ask for a research budget of $50,000. And when they ask you why, say, I want to completely destroy a car. It's hard to justify that expense for a lot of people, right? Uh, those aren't the only things. You're going to want car insurance. Um, it's funny calling up the insurance agency and saying, like, I want car insurance on this car. And like, what are you using it for? Like, recreation is what you tell them, by the way. Say you're using it for recreation. Uh, you may brick your car in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, it gets towed. It needs fixed. That cost us $6,000. Uh, registration. Uh, there's a license plate if anyone want to look up, you know, look up uh, the, the, the Prius. But registration costs money, insurance. There's a bunch of expenses with doing this research. It just ends up being terribly expensive. Right. And so you know, when you want to get started hacking and you want to hack you know, Adobe Reader or Firefox, it's free. Like if you want to move up in the world a little bit, you want to hack an iPhone, it's like 500 bucks or something, right? And so these are things we're used to paying and doing research on. And even, you know, if you want to get a new copy of Ida Pro, maybe it's a couple thousand bucks or something. So, so we're used to that, but then like the Prius is way the hell down here at $40,000. We can't expect people like to, to put out that kind of money. And I don't want to be driving in a car that no one's looking at because they can't afford to, to pay for a car. Yeah, exactly. And after we did the first project, we realized that A, we wanted to do another cyber fast track project, obviously. And, uh, and B, we wanted to lower the barrier of entry for all this stuff. We figure if you could forward a copy of like Ida Pro and a laptop, uh, what that puts you around somewhere like five grand. Uh, if we could move it to where you could do automotive research to that level, more and more of us could actually start doing the research instead of only people who got grants from DARPA. So that's this talk, is, is how, do you, how do you do car research without buying a car? Um, Lower the cost, right? Cars are expensive. We've, we've seen that. They're just pricey. You buy them used and they're still very pricey. Buying them new is even more expensive. Um, but there's computers in those cars. And when we did the first kind of project, we had to buy replacement computers a bunch. And we mostly got these off eBay a lot of times for a couple hundred dollars. So maybe if we could just start looking at the computers used, um, we could isolate them and do something with them. Right. And so most of this research is Okay, so you can buy one of the computers from the car, and if your car is going to have maybe 20, 30 of these computers. Um, so you buy one of these, and can you wire it up, make it work? And then does, is it going to work just like the car or not? What do you have to do to make it work exactly like it's in the car? Because if it only does half the things, then maybe it's not interesting. Or if it acts in a weird way, you want it to act exactly like it's in the car so you can do research on it. And, and know that if you go get a car after that, it's going to work. Yeah, this is nice research you can do before you, say, go buy an automobile. Uh, lastly, we need to have kind of a mobile platform. We need something that moves, that has locomotion, right? 
um, and we needed to figure out a way to provide locomotion, which we'll show you how we did that very cost effectively uh, later in the slides. The other thing that's cool about lowering the cost is uh, even if you can afford a car, um, it's, it's like if you're going to attack you know, an image parser or something, you have like 20 to pick from, and you can just sort of try them all and find the easy one. Well, if you, just, if you commit to buying a car, and maybe it's super secure, and you're like, oh, fuck, I spent all this money on this car, and I couldn't hack it. So it's like if you could just try a bunch of cars, you could find the easy one to hack. And, and so while you can't necessarily buy 10 cars, you can buy 10 ECUs, one from each car, and, and look at them you know, briefly and see which one's the weak one. Yeah, when we initially did the first auto project, we were totally, you know, we were sweating it. We bought all these cars, we bought $50,000 worth of cars, and if we couldn't pull anything off, our report was gonna be like, we suck, we couldn't do anything, right? And it was nerve wracking. We, but if you, if you do it this way, it takes some of the stress away. Right, so if you're, if you're like us, the hardware part of it is the hardest part. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's some stuff that you'll need to learn to do what we're talking about, but it's all easy stuff. Most of you guys probably know how to do this. So you need to like figure out some very, very basic electronics. Um, you're gonna have to figure out how CAN works, which is basically something that we talked about in our last talk. And then uh, one of the important things is to, to get the, the official wiring diagrams from the manufacturer, because those things are like super helpful. We, we started it without looking at any of the wiring diagrams from, say, Ford and Toyota, and we thought... Mostly because we didn't even understand what they were. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, they were just drawings and pictures to me. I was like, oh, no, I'll just figure it out. Um, uh, you realize, after you start looking at these things, and you realize that they have the listing of which pins are for can high and can low, which pins are for ground, which pins are for power. These are things that stupid software people like Charlie and I didn't really think about when we started the project. No, because we were thinking about purely, like, there's a network and there's packets and we're sending packets. Like we don't really care about the hardware. Exactly. Very application layer stuff is what we focus. All right. So let's talk briefly about CAN and what you need to know at least to, to do this project. So uh, I mean we already mentioned some of the, the things about CAN which are everything's broadcast. There's no sort of authentication. There is no addressing. Um, but physically it's just two wires and um, you know normally they're they're uh, twisted, like you see in the picture there, but they don't necessarily have to be. Um, and then the, the two wires that are terminated at some point by resistors, and that's it. So that's, that's CAN, physically. If you want to uh, make your own CAN network at home, this is what it looks like. Two 120 ohm resistors, uh, you know, uh, CAN high and CAN low. That's basically what a CAN network is there, if you have a little breadboard and some resistors and some wires, right? Um, the other basics that uh, if you looked at our research before, we used these things called ECOM cables, and we had them hooked up to ODB2. But if you just leave the wires, uh, you know, exposed and hook them up to CAN high and CAN low, it works kind of ju just, just as it would in the car. You can sniff traffic off the CAN bus, and you can inject ca uh, CAN traffic as well with the library we released. So the cool thing is we've already written all this code for you to do injection and reading and manipulation. All right, so the same tools we talked about in our last research and the same, uh, you know, same things to buy, same, same software, all that stuff still works. It's just now it's sitting on your, de you know, your desk instead of inside your car. Uh, some ECU basics. Uh, you're going to need power. That it probably shouldn't be too surprising, right? These things run off uh, something called electricity, which we just discovered during this project, which is amazing. Um, you're going to have to ground them, and they generally have one or more pairs of CAN high and CAN low. It depends on what their function is in the automobile. Um, as we saw before, CAN is twisted pair wires, you know, one's uh, CAN high, one's CAN low. Wiring diagrams are your best friend. These really help you figure out these. After, you know, our fifth or sixth ECU of doing these, it went from taking a couple days to get one figured out to you know, an hour to get it set up and working on our, on our test bench. Right. So, so this slide basically talks about the very first thing you would try, which is you buy an ECU from eBay or something, you plug in power and ground, and you plug in can high and can low, and you turn it on. Um, sometimes that's going to be enough to get started. Sometimes you're going to need more stuff. And basically the rest of this research is what is the more stuff to get this to work. Yeah, it's neat seeing can packets fly out of the ECU. Uh, whether or not it's working correctly or not, you still know what messages that specific ECU is sending, which is hard to do in the car, right? Because everything's broadcast in nature. Right. So that's the first step is you can at least figure out what that ECU is sending as opposed to you just see all the traffic and you have no idea what's sending what. Uh, these are from Toyota's website. You sign up for a mechanics account at TIS. 
Uh, what do you know? They show you the actual connectors. They tell you which ones are ground, which ones are uh, power, you know, which ones are CAN high and CAN low. Uh, if you look at the other wiring diagram, uh, you see this is a very simple one. This is the seatbelt ECU. Uh, you, know, you see the ignition coming in here and power. Those are, those are both power, um, CAN high and CAN low, and then these are seatbelt motors and ground, right? Uh, this is very simple. This is the most uh, simplistic one, which we started with because we wanted to start simple. But you see, by reading these diagrams, you can get it set up outside of the car. All right. So you can here you can imagine you you know exactly what you're going to need to set up. You're going to need power, ground, can, and then you're going to need some wires that run to the seatbelt motors. Um, and then supposedly the ECU will be able to turn those motors on or off or whatever. Exactly. And then of course some ECUs are really like this is the simplest ECU. Some some connectors are going to have maybe 100 or 200 different connections that go into and out of them. So like the one that controls the engine is super complicated. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of complicated ones. This is just simple. All right, so Chris already mentioned this a little bit, but uh, one of the first things we wanted to do was, because we struggled so much with this on the first project, was try to figure out what each ECU, what traffic each ECU is making on the CAN network. So like there's all these messages. We had no idea which ones were, were from which, which ECU. and you know, trying to reverse engineer what each message did was hard when you had no idea like where it was coming yeah. from. For example, when we wanted to figure out which messages were used with steering and we had our parallel park assist with the cars, we would get out for hours on end and parallel park the car and try to see which messages were changing. Um, if we were smarter, we would have yanked the ECU that was responsible for parking the car out and see which messages it emitted and we would have had our answer in uh, a day instead of weeks. Yeah, for example, in the Ford, the ECU that sends out messages to, to park the car sends out four messages. That's it out of like hundreds that you normally see. And of those four, there's only it's obvious which one it is. Yeah. So once you, if you would have just done that to start with, you would you would have solved the problem immediately. Which instead of like you said, it took us a week or two to figure it out the, the old way, which is looking through 200 messages and seeing which ones seem to change with the steering. So uh, yeah, uh, the first thing we decided to do was make a thing that we called a can bridge. Um, basically, we wanted to isolate an ECU, but in the car, and pass messages back and forth, right? So we wanted to physically cut wires, uh, send those wires into our computer, and then have the computer forward those messages back and forth to the actual computer, right? That way, we would see what messages were coming in and what messages were being spit out. So we could isolate the incoming traffic as opposed to the outgoing traffic the way we saw it. Right, just like a switch on a, you know, a normal network, and except then you can see which, which side of the, you know, which interface the messages were coming from, you would know what, you know, what the ECU was sending. And the way we did this is with two ECOM cables, one that went to the actual ECU and the other that went to the CAN bus, and they had this little mini CAN bus in between, right? This is coming from the car, this is the car's network going to an ECOM cable, uh, there's the ECU that went to the CAN network that went to another ECOM cable, and they basically just passed information back and forth. And we have a video kind of showing on how, uh, how this works. Um, we have the Toyota Prius. Well, we got sound. Uh, with yeah. the CAN really bridge hooked up, though? but not powered on right there. now. It beeps or There's something. no blinking oh, lights, yeah. which means the So anyway, you can see there's running. two ECOM cables, so one to go to the, the real on, network and one to go to the isolated ECU. And Chris no turns on the car here. Between the so right, right now, it's not PCI. actually bridging and the, the, the gap there. And you'll see that it says check, check PCS system. system. That, that means the seatbelt ECU is offline. Something's wrong. We're not forwarding the messages the back and forth. Is not communicating. So if we turn the car off and then start our CAN bridge, it's now working on both of those. So now it is going to pass the messages back and forth. Uh, blinking right see now. Blink, blinky lights mean good things for us. We'll see that the Prius is turned on. And if we wait for the same amount of time before, uh, we won't see any check PCS error. That's because the traffic from the CAN bus, which is that little plug there, is going to ECOM cable, going to the PC. The PC is going to the ECOM cable. Great camera work by me. ECU. <laughs> Uh, so it's cool, it. right? Because our uh, can bridge working. Yeah, the, the, this is really neat because you can isolate an ECU in a car. Why is that good? You don't have to worry about hooking up all the sensors and actuators and power and things like that, right? You can just clip a couple wires and get this bridge working, and you'll be able to see what messages that ECU spits out and what messages are is it seeing on its portion of the can network. Um, 
Right. You could even isolate and figure out which messages it cares about by only forwarding to it some of the messages and seeing if it still behaves like you, you think. Yeah, you could also use our Cambridge to manipulate traffic. Uh, you could change data values as it's being sent out or received. So you could use it for really a, a plethora of things. It sounds really awesome, but it turns out it's kind of stupid. Yeah, it, it kind of sucks. Pretty. <laughs> this thing uh, kind of fucking sucks, basically. Uh, it still requires a car, right? So that doesn't lower our barrier of entry. You still need a car for this thing. Right. Um, the ecom cable to PC to ecom cable is uh, very slow and very CPU intensive. Uh, laptop battery dies relatively quickly when doing this, which doesn't really give you all that much time. Right. Plus, you, I don't know. So yeah, it, it's just not really practical. We wanted to do it to you know start this this phase of this research, and we realized that it just kind of fucking sucked. All right, so the right way to do it is to either buy an ECU or rip the ECU out, completely out of the car, get it working on your bench, and then you know what's going on, and you don't have to sit out in your cold or hot car. Yes. Yeah, sitting outside in the cold. Uh, we both live in cold weather places in the United States in the winter. Uh, not fun. Sitting out in the heat. Again, the car doesn't have AC on or it's broken. Uh, again, not all that fun. All right, so uh, what you want to do is... As, as your first stab is you just get the ECU, you buy it or you, you rip one out, and you, you, you hook up the power, the ground, and, and the can, and you, and you see what happens. Does it turn on? Uh, do you see traffic? Um, and it, it's really sort of hard because if you don't see traffic, maybe the ECU doesn't generate traffic. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you screwed it up, which is probably actually the case. Yeah. Maybe, or, maybe it's dependent on some sensor in the car to actually activate itself as well. Right. So, yeah, it might be mad because it, it's missing something that you don't know or that you haven't put onto it yet. Um, so there's lots of things that could go wrong, but this is basically what it looks like sitting on your, on yeah. your bench. I figure this is the seatbelt ECU from the Toyota Prius. You can buy these online. Um, you know, the hookups are going to the seatbelt motors. We have uh, power, we have ground, uh, can high, can low, another power. And generally, if you turn that thing on, it spits out traffic and you can see it, which is to us pretty neat. Well, how do you know these are working? Uh, the easiest ones have uh, uh, audible or visual, you know, notes. We power this guy on, it uh, makes this clicking sound, the DVD's loading, the screen turns on. Uh, sweet, this is awesome, right? These are the easy ones because you can physically see this thing turn on, so you, at least you know you have it somewhat hooked up correctly, right? right? And so the cool thing about this ECU is if you wanted to research, uh, you know, the Bluetooth stack of the Toyota, you could do that right here from, you know, your room instead of from being out in the car. Yeah, so it's can, like super convenient. You call and a Savage cheap. Yard or go on eBay and find one of these things for less than a hundred dollars, maybe a couple hundred bucks, and you can start your remote attack vector research without a car. Right. Line up ten of these and find which one has the easy bugs and then, you know, maybe get that car. And then here is another uh, video of just watching traffic. So this is the easiest setup. This is a, it has 12 connectors. I only have power and, and can to it. But you can still see, even with that, it doesn't work quite right, but it at least works good enough that you can watch some traffic. So here I'm gonna, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna watch traffic coming from it. Then we're gonna power on the ECU and... So there's traffic coming from it. So I can see right there all the uh, this is, happens to be the module that controls the steering of the car. So I can see the four messages that come out of it, and uh, that's it. So I already have, have know a lot about you know, the, the messages that are coming out. This is how most ECUs are. They're not, there's going to be no audible indication or visual indication that they're on and running. You're going to have to hook up your ecom cable and kind of sniff the CAN bus. And if it's emitting CAN traffic, that means at least it's power on and running. If it's not, Maybe it requires something, most likely you have it hooked up wrong, but uh, this is just one of the indicators that these things are functional. Uh, what's really neat, though, is if you have, say, like a baseline capture from the car, right? You've isolated an ID, uh, you turn on the car, and you see what the traffic looks like. Again, this is for the seatbelt ECU. It's a very simple one. In the car, it kind of has uh, some beacons saying, hey, I'm in the car. And then if everything's all good, which it is because the car was functional at this point, it's sending zeros, right? Well, when we did the same test on the bench without everything hooked up, um, you see it sends out the same beacons, but this beacon's different, which I think means, uh-oh, I don't have all my stuff. And then you see instead of zeros, it just sends one. 
And that's meaning it's an error code, right? You can think of it much like uh, a, a function call in programming returning one or zero based on failure. This is just emitting traffic saying, I've failed. I don't work properly right now. So uh, again, it's nice to have a baseline capture from the car to compare to, because then you can see if your ECU on, on the bench is working just as it would in the car. Right. And then you can learn a lot by just looking at these kind of things. Because now you wouldn't have known necessarily before what this byte was, but now you know it has, it's something to do with the status. And, and you can start to figure out by looking at, at, at these more, like which bytes have to do with sensor values and all that stuff. So it really helps you figure out what these messages are doing. Yeah. And it seems like manufacturers have very similar kind of error codes. In other ECUs, I would see a, a bit flipped when, between being in the car and out of the car. And you start to see the patterns for that manufacturer saying like, oh, yeah, the third byte is the status byte, whether it's working properly or not. After doing a bunch of these, you kind of learn a lot about them. All right, so, so far we only hooked up CAN and power, and, and like we said, usually you have to do more than that. So here is uh, the seatbelt ECU, but now we've added the, the actual motors that it expects. How do you get this to work? You add sensors and actuators. Oh. <laughs> um, I thought you had a video here, but... Uh, oh, well. I guess. Maybe that, it's later. Yeah, it's later. Uh, go ahead to yours. All right, so here's, uh, so here's just a, an idea. So, like, you'll... A lot of the ECUs will require, you know, sensors hooked up to it. That's what they do is they, they read in values and they, they do stuff. Um, and again, like to keep the cost down, you don't necessarily want to buy, you know, if you end up buying every single piece of electronics from the car, like you might as well just have bought the car. So there's a lot of ways you can kind of fake things. And uh, so like in this particular ECU, you, you can fake the, the right oil pressure monitor by our sensor by just... Yeah. If, the way it works, and you can read this in the manual for, for the mechanics. The See, the light came on because I, I don't have it to ground. And then if I plug it back in, it goes off. So, so all it does, the sensor, it just sends some, it, it detects whether it's, it's, it's wired to ground or not. And so all you have to do, you don't have to buy like an oil pressure sensor and you know, some huge apparatus. You just take a wire and put yeah. it around. Again, a lot of this, uh, these can be forged because they're there's simple things. Uh, it, you know, a lot of switches in cars are they send uh, a voltage over this amount or less than this amount depending if the button's pressed or if this thing is happening. So you can fake a lot of these things just by wiring stuff. And right. uh, again, I don't know anything about electronics, but I knew if uh, I just kept on trying things, things tend to work sometimes. Right, and, and likewise on this one too, there's uh, the way that it figures out the fuel is it sends some some amount of voltage down a wire, and depending on what it gets back, it knows how much fuel there is. So if you just stick a resistor there, it's happy. So you can, you can get away without buying a lot of sensors because uh, you can just fake it. Yeah. One of, the, one of the bigger hurdles for these things, though, was not only do they require sensors, but they required interaction with other ECUs in the car, right? Uh, right. Again, so even I if you had everything physically hooked up exactly like the car, if it's not receiving messages from the other ECUs, it's going to know and it's not going to be happy. Yeah, you know, things depend on what the, what the RPM is, and a lot of the times that's not a wire to a sensor, that's actually sent as a message over the CAN bus. So there's computers that are relying on other computers to get its information. Um, how can you, you know, make this work? So you, just, you can just simulate messages and we, send them. We, I, I think we kind of screwed up because we called this CAN Simulator 3000. So in the year 3000, this is going to look really old when people are using it. But I think we, you know, we have like six or seven years till that happens. Um, but this is it. It's like 20 lines of Python. What it does, it takes a capture that you got from a car um, and sends it on the CAN bus. And what do you know when you send all this information? Um, the ECU is going to say, hey, I'm receiving the right you know, bits of information. Right. So if you think about the ECU, all it can tell, like if you want to know whether it thinks it's in the car or not, the only way it knows if it's in the car is whether it, it has the connections to its sensors and its actuators and what it can read on the CAN bus. And so if you can fake all that, it has no idea if it's in the car or not. Exactly. So, um, so here's finally. Yeah, here's the video we're talking about. Okay. So we have our phase three set up here. And we saw before how it was, uh, this is the seatbelt ECU again. It was emitting the, uh, the, so the, the real seatbelt motors. Yeah. I couldn't use those because it almost took my thumb off when I tried to uh, engage them once. So I changed out little tiny motors so I didn't cut my fingers off. Um, and before it was not setting out the right information because it wasn't right. But now we have our CAN simulator. And if we can send seatbelt codes after the ECU thinks it's okay, 
then it will actually think it's in the car because it's getting messages from all the other computers, which is just forged traffic. And we can uh, engage the seatbelt motors uh, just as we did if you saw the video in our first pair of, uh, part of research. This is the driver's side, and this is the passenger side seatbelt motor. So if you were to get in an accident, um, they would want to tighten the belts. So you can see that the motor's running. So Chris is sending messages on the CAN bus telling the car that it's getting in an accident. And so it tightens yeah. the seatbelt. And that the seatbelt ECU... And when he, when he sent those same messages car. without faking all the rest of the traffic, it didn't work. Yeah. It knew something was wrong, so it doesn't operate. So it seems like ECUs, when they're in an incorrect state, just cease to perform their actions, um, which isn't too surprising. But if you hook up all the sensors, and forge traffic, that thing thought it was in the Toyota Prius and would respond to messages accordingly. I heard that video is, is now a, a major motion picture. It is a major motion <laughs> picture. It's funded by Columbia House, uh, opening in theaters August 2015, so go check it out. All right, so here's another ECU, and it, uh, again, you'll see that it, it doesn't work until you send it messages. So um, this right, is yeah, the and, instrument uh, cluster from the Ford. Some power. So just give it power first off. And you can tell by looking at it, like, all the lights are on, and the little status is, like, dash, dash, dash miles ago. So it's really unhappy. So then I start to fake by sending it a bunch of traffic on one of its can. It has two can interfaces. So now it's much happier. Like, all the lights are good, except a couple, and then, uh, you know, the, the bottom readout is good. See how it even thinks it's having RPMs right there, right? It thinks it's in the car, and the car's idling right, So then right I just now. sent messages on the second can interface, and now it's totally happy. So it has no idea it's not in the car at this point. Yeah. So if you can get these baseline captures from a car, uh, you can, you can you know, make these things think that they're in the car. Right. And so, so you don't need a car anymore. What you do is you need a car for like 20 minutes. So if you can just borrow a car or Zip rent car, one, or rent one, or do something. Take a bunch of captures, start buying stuff off the internet, and you're going to be good. So here's another one. This is uh, the power steering control module from the Ford. So it's still wired into the car. Um, because the only way you can really see the power steering working is if it's hooked to, a, to an actual car. So you can see, like, right now, it should work, but it's not. There was no power steering assist. I faked network traffic, and now the power steering works. Power steering. And uh, I wouldn't drive that car. Um, you can start adding more and more and more, right? So this is my workbench at home. This is a large portion of the Toyota Prius that we ripped out of the car. Uh, Seatbelt ECU, the whole pre-collision system, parking assist, uh, power steering for, uh, for the, the, the parking, um, sense of parking sensors there, rear va backup view camera. So you can start collecting all these pieces and start formulating a complete, not a complete automobile, a, a large portion of the automobile that you want to look at. Uh, if you want to figure out how you would, say, attack steering or something like that, you don't need the car, really. You need a car. You, you probably need a baseline capture. But then all these parts are relatively cheap if you buy them used or from a salvage yard. Right. And the cool thing about, like, you don't have to buy all these parts. Like, if you really only care about steering, you don't need the seatbelt ECU. Yeah. But um, the, th the cool thing about the more ECUs you do add, the less traffic you have to fake. Because yeah. now you've got real ECUs talking to real ECUs. And so it actually gets simpler the more ECUs you, you, you add to your car. And the reason we had, if you go back one, Charlie, uh, these here uh, is because we had these things called cyber fast track milestones to hit that had certain number of sensors and ECUs. So we had to add these to add digits to our bank account. <laughs> so that's what we had to do to get those working. I'll be here all night. Tip your waitresses. All right. So here's like, it, I mean, the only thing that becomes complicated is the more ECUs you add, the more sort of like wire spaghetti mess you get. This, this ends up being, you know, a disaster. There's all the power up top. Here's two different CAN networks, there's grounds, there's CAN highs, there's CAN lows. It just ends up being complicated and you have a lot of wires. I'm sure there's better ways to do this. Yeah. Uh, probably like Josh or some other... Yeah, I'm sure Dot like, Monk's just shaking his head over there because we're know. idiots. But. Yeah. They probably are like, oh my god, I can't believe that you guys did it that way. But this is the way we did it and it worked. So uh, The bad thing is like one day like your kid bumps the table and then something stops working and you're like, oh man, what, the, what am I going to do? It's going to take me 10 hours to figure out which wire came loose. Or you go to a conference and drink for a week straight and you come back and you're like, what is all this shit? I don't know. I don't know what any of this is anymore. So you have to pl unplug everything and then restart from scratch. Chris's housekeeper comes in. Yeah. All of his no, Susu, Su, don't pull the wires out. Stop it. <laughs> the wires are all bundled up in a nice little bag for him. Yeah. <laughs> that happened. <laughs>
Okay. Clean so my office. The whole point of doing this research isn't to just wire stuff up. It's to like find out whether you can control things and whether you could attack the car and like how does how do the, the ECUs bridge and like so you can learn everything you want to know and we'll show you how some of the attacks that we talked about last summer, yeah. you can do on the bench as well. Yeah, if you see all of our attacks, we've really replicated most of them here on our bench. We have um, now added a oh, couple this more is ECUs like stuff and you parts. Said. Yeah. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. Mm, okay, all right. right here. It's on. We'll see the instrument cluster starts up, but it doesn't tell us the speed, yeah. and it's all lit Again, up. Again, like Charlie's, it was kind of you know now it wasn't getting we'll the right messages from start the car. Simulating our traffic. Um, so. What we did and is hook up a bunch of ECUs and sensors, the simulate traffic, and most speed. everything that didn't most have a physical wire was happy. Look, it thinks the hybrid system's okay. It up. says we're going zero miles per hour. And it says we're in park. Right? Like so set the speed of the car. And we can set the speed so of the car as well. So if you wanted to do instrument before. cluster attacks, uh, you don't really the need the car. You can buy these parts, set them up on the bench, and you know figure out your attacks. And maybe if they're not possible, get different pieces for a different car. Uh, right. before spending $50,000. All right, so here's basically the same thing on the Ford. So you can see that you can still do the attack. Yeah. So you can set the speed, like, you know, so you know, you know what message to send, you know it works, and so then if you just hop in someone's car, you know it's going to work. Um, you can even do things uh, okay, like we can lane keep assist. Test. This is uh, steering. The steering uh, yeah, this well. is the steering, right? In the Prius, right? if you're going off the road, it's it would on. recognize that you're going off the road and, and turn the steering wheel for you. Now we can um, steer the we wheel. We can well. figure out what those messages are, get this all set up on the bench, and start trying messages to get the steering to work. Uh, I was having a hard time pressing the buttons here, but you'll see this slowly start to uh, jerk left, right? And so then that's the there. steering uh, of the, the, uh, the Prius. So you can do the attacks that we did that you saw last year, but without physically having the car. All right, so we could have done all the research we did last year on the bench and then just verified it worked in the car. Yep. So here's the same thing for Ford. So, wow, amazing. It sounds like everyone's really impressed. Oh, so. Uh, that beeping noise was actually the back sensors. So it like so we had a bunch of ECUs here, including the sensors to know it thought the car was in reverse, and it's it sensed me. Like obviously, it wasn't going to run me over because I'm in my house. But so, uh, so here's another one. Again, backup camera and sensors. You can see all this stuff working. Uh, this is a little bit of a giveaway on what we're going to talk about in a minute. But you can see that it's obviously not in a car. And then I said, Oh my God, there's a child back there. I use my children as test subjects. He could have very easily used a cone or a <laughs> box, but he asked his child to stand behind this. I mean, what are they good for? If they <laughs> Other than help... if they can't help the security research, yeah. I don't know what they're good for. Yeah. So, if you're, yeah, if you're that's not... why I don't pay child support. Yeah. I was like, hey, you want to help me do some car research? Stand here. So, all okay. right. Anyway, so you can also start to learn things about like the way the sensors work. So here is the a wheel sensor from the Ford, and you can figure out like there's a sensor, there's a thing, and, and you can see that it's working, and you can see exactly which pack or which bytes in the CAM messages are uh, the the EC reporting the speed of the wheel. So here is uh, I'm going to show in a very slow and, and elegant fashion. Um, here is the messages going across that the ECU is sending. And then I'm just going to spin that little piece of metal, and you'll see the, the stuff changing. So, so you, can, you can start to figure out exactly which bytes have to do with that particular sensor, what the values mean, you know, what normal values are, and that kind of stuff, without ever having to, to get into a car. And this is really neat, even though it's a simplistic one. Uh, the first kind of feat that you have to overcome is what messages, what IDs are associated with what ECU. And then you have to uh, associate the Apple, uh, actual bytes, right, of data. And a lot of the time, for us in the original research, it was guesswork. Like, uh, I assume that these two bytes are the tire speed. But right. with doing it's it like this way... I drove way, around and this byte seemed to change, so I think yeah. it might be the speed or yeah. something. I don't but, know. but doing the way Charlie did here, you can verify that, oh, yeah, this, these two bytes are associated with this sensor and this is the speed. Like, right. you know for a fact. And like at our research last year, I knew that there was eight, eight bytes, and I knew that they were, you know, every two was a wheel, but I didn't know which wheel until I actually tore it apart and, and messed with it. But. So then we already showed you can start to mess with infotainment systems, and, and this is just more a video of showing that the infotainment system actually works completely. It has GPS, 
And you have FM radio. James Brown. Satellite radio. Oh yeah, here's some James Brown. Oh, uh, the sound didn't work. Anyway, and, and you, can, you can Bluetooth pair your phone with it. You can do whatever. And you can do all your research here uh, inside your house. I, I think th this piece of equipment is the most interesting alone. Because if you want to remotely compromise a car, you're probably going to start with the infotainment system that has Bluetooth, telematics, maybe Wi-Fi, USB, something like that. So you know, doing this type of research literally right here is, is probably where you want to start when you're starting to do the automotive research. All right, so it's all awesome and great, but there's some things that you can't necessarily do uh, on, on your bench, on your workbench, that you could do in a car. So like, here is an example of an attack we did where uh, in the Ford, the brakes didn't work anymore. And this is the one that made me crash into my garage, if you've been following me on Twitter. So uh, if you have your, your, your ABS system on your bench and you run the attack, like you know something happened, but you don't necessarily know that you would have crashed a car. So you, you learn something, but you're going to have to actually get in a car to figure out what's going on. So here is running the same exact attack um, against the brakes. So if you, like I didn't know this was actually going to happen, so I did it. But it starts spitting out all this like oil and crap. Uh, all over my electronics. Um, and so like I knew like, hey, I really did something, but I didn't know that that would really, how it would affect the actual vehicle. Yeah. You knew that that was the braking because this was the attack you performed in the car, but if you went the other way around, you would say, something happened because it's spitting fluid all over my electronics, <laughs> but I don't know that that's actually, the brake's not working. <laughs> right, so, so you're gonna have to still do some things, like you're gonna have to verify in a real car, um, but still at least I, I figured out exactly what message does something to the brakes. Um, you can go so far as to actually get an OBD2 connection to your, your, your bench network and plug in real like mechanics tools and then you can snip the traffic that mechanics tools do. You can reverse engineer what the me mechanics tools are doing, which is how we figured out like the, the crypto keys and stuff like that. So you can do that on the bench as well. So here is uh, the bench, here is, that's the Ford mechanics tool. And here I'm just showing that it's actually wired up and working and um, it's going to be, it's not a very good video because I was great it myself. Great just great. Yeah, so you can just see this number changing on the right because it's, it's measuring something in the car. And it, that blurry thing is going to change. You can tell it's different. Yeah. You can't tell the actual value, but it, you can tell that it, it changed. So anyway, the point is mechanics tools work on the, on the, on the bench as well. Uh, and that's where we learned a lot of the attacks. Yeah, in the original attacks, we learned not only how to do a lot of the attacks, but definitely how to defeat the security access crypto key thing with the mechanics tools. So again, if you want to start figuring out all the crypto keys for all these ECUs and manufacturers, don't need to buy a car, you just need the mechanics tools and an ECU. All right, so working on the bench is, is pretty cool because like we said before, you can save a lot of time once you've, you can use it to isolate ECUs and figure out which can IDs they do, which, which will help you figure out what the messages do instead of the way we did it, which was very slow. <laughs> um, you, can, you can do things like figuring out the security access keys uh, by plugging in the mechanics tool. You can start to like play around without worrying about crashing. So like one of the things we would do, or at least I used to do, is uh, I would record a bunch of traffic of say like me driving and going crazy with the steering wheel and stuff. And then I would just go drive down the highway and I would replay the traffic. And probably nothing was going to happen, but there was a chance at any time I would just crash. And so, <laughs> yeah. like, ideally, you would have a better way to do that. Yes, safer, as the kids say. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would do the same thing. I would, you know, capture the car braking, and then I'd just start driving around the city and playing it, and the car would stop, and I'd be like, go around, just go around, <laughs> assholes, I'm stopped. Uh, so you can do all this stuff with being a bit safer and, and not, you know, maybe killing someone. Right. In my defense, like, at first I tried going really slow, and then it didn't work, and then I tried a little faster, and I was like, God damn it, I'm just driving down the highway. <laughs> So uh, anyway, but it's much safer if you do uh, and, the, and the really cool thing, remote attack vectors, right? You're, it's going to be easy to get these things up and running because you're usually going to see some visual uh, you know, representation that it's on. Uh, then you can start, you know, get your Uber Tooth One out, start fuzzing, start doing something. Um, it's a good place to start for the remote research for sure. All right, but it's not perfect. So you definitely are going to need to get a baseline of traffic from an actual car. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be too difficult. Um, the other thing is we already mentioned that you know, there's, there's going to be maybe some sensors it needs that you're not going to really want to get out of a car because it's too hard or you're, you're not going to buy them. So there's going to be some problems maybe hooking some of this stuff up. The other thing is it's going to be hard, we, we mentioned with the brakes, like I don't know if, if my brake attack really affects the brakes until I try it in a real car. Yeah. 
the, the, the way we figured out breaks was uh, I went behind my neighbor's house and I got four big trash cans and I would back up the Prius and I would go and just smash through the trash cans and record the traffic that happened. It's hard to do that with a bench because the bench can't smash through trash cans. Right. So there's some things like it would be like nice if, if you could make your bench move. And so that was what we did next. And, and then this is something I just did the other day just to prove all this stuff works. I just ordered a random ECU for a GM, some car I've never looked at. Ordered it, plugged it in, it all works. Uh, like you can see, like I've connected my phone over Bluetooth to it. So like I could start uh, examining the remote attack service of this, of you know, a particular car. And this thing cost me like you know, 200 bucks or something. And you called me. Yeah. And I didn't I called, answer. I called him on this actual, you know, through this phone. I was like, I'm calling you from a GM, whatever. I was just like, voicemail, I don't want to talk yeah. to this jerk. That actually did happen. All right, so the, the next step was, well, there were two reasons to do this step. Uh, one was to, because it would be cool to see if we could get some movement involved and get some real pieces. Like, instead of making the, the you, you guys weren't impressed when we had the thing <laughs> yeah. on the bench move the steering. Yeah, you know? I was really impressed when I did that, but obviously, you, you guys know, no one hears. So we're like, well, maybe we could put it in something like a car, and then it would turn something that was like a steering wheel, and then you would be more impressed. Um, also, it would just be like badass. <laughs> so yeah, like, and our answer was... Go karts, right? Right. So uh, we, you know, we we figured if the government is going to buy us cars, maybe they would buy us like go karts and other things like that. Yeah. The United States government is really just pissing away their money on research. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, we we tried as much as possible not to actually call these go karts, but like mobile platform testers or something. Yeah. Like, nice fancy government name, so they would give us the money. Right. So so anyway, so we bought a couple of these like super rad go karts, and then we just started attaching all the ECUs to it. And wiring so, yeah. it up. So this is very much like the workbench. And you see the seat belts are safely attached with zip ties here. Duct tape on the front, because uh, that keeps everything together. And then wired in the back. So now we have the bench, but on something that moves. All right. So then you can start to test out sensors and uh, you know, attacks uh, and sort of something that moves. And, and maybe you could figure out that the brake attack really did work. And it's still reasonably cheap. Like the go-karts were like 2,000 US dollars. Right. And then you have the most sophisticated go-kart in the world. That is true. I'm pretty sure we do own two of those. I'm not sure which one's more sophisticated, but you can see that it's sort of a jumble of wires and like some of the funny things is is like on the front of the cart, there's just like ecom cable strapped into the <laughs> to the go kart. This is SAE certified United States. All this will pass inspection in every uh, 40, 48 of the 50 states. And I back this thing up right up to my child. <laughs> yeah. uh, here's a video maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We can Okay, so here's the go-kart. You can see we have this with SAE standard fittings in the front. Oh, same joke. Oh, I ruined God. my own joke. That's terrible. And we have our lane keeper. There goes my thousand dollars for best speaker. Support, even a millimeter we were never wave getting sensor it. on the front. So now you can That's do true. testing of your things like pre-collision system on this go-kart. So you see it's got the sensor. He could uh, right literally drive this into trash cans like he described and it would work. Issue, and you could get traffic captures that way. To the Prius' steering column. Uh, right now, it won't fit because either driver the Prius steer. will not fit. <laughs> I got down two here. steering wheels in this I'm bitch. I'm going to have a friend eventually come spot well, this, maybe, if that's possible. You see the seatbelts are securely fastened with zip ties oh, because this Chris. was not designed to Let jokes. me just turn off the sound. Yeah. Because that's just I just, uh, and I'll keep ruining my own jokes <laughs> here. Uh, no, and then you have the CAN network in the back. You know, the, uh, this is the same thing we had on the bench, but wired up to a go kart. Why, you may ask? Because we wanted go-karts. Yeah, and someone would buy us go-karts. Yeah. So, yeah, so I wasn't yeah. going to pay for it myself, honestly. All right, so, uh, so we, did, we rigged it up as, as closely to an actual car as we could. So if there were multiple CAN networks isolated by some gateway or something, we actually did that. Um, we, we had as much sensors as possible, um, you know, actuators when, when possible. And one of the things you notice there is um, the go-karts had a little 12-volt battery, but it wasn't enough to power all. It wasn't designed actually design, you know, to hold 10 ECUs. Yeah. Right. So it's made to start the go kart, not power bunch ECUs. <laughs> so we had to buy a car battery. Right. Um, yeah, but my go kart was like way better than Chris's. It yeah, had, it was. It had it has actual power steering. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't have two steering wheels. I have one, <laughs> and uh, it has navigation, satellite radio, rear view camera. Let me do this for you, so you don't have to do it yourself. Uh, sorry, I can keep going. <laughs> no, so anyway, my go kart's pretty badass. It was. Um, it was pretty badass. So the, the cool thing is, uh, 
you know, so you can actually do some mobility tests and you can see this. So you can make the steering wheel actually turn maybe, you yeah. know. Uh, By the way, uh, you can use this if you're doing, trying to get research funding from your company or someone, call it mobility testing instead of buy me a goat cart. That'll work much better than buy me a goat cart. Right. And, and you know, like we said, it was just fun. Why are then these things sucked? I mean, it really did. You're just Everything running about wires. it, actually. Everything about these go-karts was just awful. <laughs> um, it took know, me a week to build it. Yeah, it, it, it literally took forever to build them. They didn't come assembled. Uh, shockingly, car parts did not fit on the go-karts, which is <laughs> not something we thought about when we bought them. Right. We were just eager to spend DARPA's money. Uh, there, we should have bought this thing. There's some like open source car that is very car-esque, and it's around uh, a little bit more expensive than the goat cart, but has like real steering columns and shit. Like it's what it would have been a way better decision if we would have done an ounce of research into this. We would have bought this yeah, instead we of go karts. Didn't do too much. It was like I found this one on the internet. I was like, whoa, it's got seat belts. <laughs> it's gonna be good. I was like, let's probably, let's get these things, man. <laughs> um, right. First of all, why these things are fun? You can say go out in your neighborhood and drive it around in traffic, which is totally legal in the United States. I don't know if it's legal or not, but we didn't get in trouble. And there's, there's the corpse of everything that was pulled out of uh, the Prius right there. And, uh, hey, don't worry. I look both ways before I pull in the street. Don't think I'm crazy. Luckily, Chris lives right next to a very safe place to test this stuff. A busy yeah. street. My neighbors love this because I'd be running this goat cart around the streets, you know, like five times a day. And since I work for a living, unlike Chris, I can only do my research at night. So about 9 or 10 o'clock at night, you'd be like, driving down the street in my goat cart. Uh, as you see, it has some off-road capabilities as well, and that duct tape, that held. I don't know if you saw that right there. That held on just fine. I mean, there's a little wiggle to it, but that's what you want. <laughs> All right, so here's my version of the, the Doom Buggy in six Looks like this is in daytime, too. You should have been working for Twitter. This is, this is the weekend. Thank you very much. I'm, I, I don't have to do it on the weekend, so. Anyway, unlike Chris's, you can actually go over bumps without all of your electronics falling apart. I didn't actually buy name brand duct tape. I went to the dollar store and bought that cheap duct tape. That's why. So here is the same steering attack that we use in the so car and on the bench. Uh, this time you'll be way more impressed because it's an actual steering wheel. Online. And uh, I'm Chris Valasek, and this is the steering wheel trick. You see the steering wheel? Let's hear it! Right there! It's a real wheel! Right here! Come on. Yeah. Uh, that's better. Not great, but better. Oh, that was a really half-hearted clap. Uh, the neat thing to know uh, on this, though, is this is something that we didn't realize in the car. I didn't actually have the angle sensor. Um, I just had the steering column. And I used lane keep assist packets, which, if you read our paper before, are limited to a couple degrees. But you saw the steering wheel turned multiple rotations, right? Is because the angle sensor I was faking was always at straight ahead, at zero, right? So you could probably use, you, we learned something, we could probably use the lane keep assist attack in the Prius by forging the steering wheel angle as well. So you kind of will come up on these things when you're missing sensors and you realize that you may be able to uh, develop a new attack as well. Right, you get a lot better idea of what the sensors do when you're, you're like getting dirty with them. Yep. So here's one more thing. Uh, so I actually rigged up uh, the speedometer to where it worked in my go-kart once again. Proving superior <laughs> engineering than Valsec Air. Um, so the way I did it is I put you know, that steering or that wheel sensor, I put it on the go kart, and then I, I like fake some stuff, and it all works out. So sort of. So you'll see it here driving. Uh, the, this time my, my kid is the cameraman in a very safe vehicle. So you can see as I speed up, the speedometer actually goes. And so you can do the actual setting the speedometer attack against a you know working speedometer. So you can see I'm going like 10 miles an hour here. And that go-kart sounds like it is about to fall apart. No, that's just how, how you want it to sound. <laughs> so you want it to squeak like that. That means it was working right. And if you look at the front, there's this like bar, the safety roll cage bar. It's not even attached. It just wiggles. <laughs> so anyway, so the speedometer actually worked. Uh, so you could do, not only can you set the speed, but you could set the speed and show how you would have to fight against the real like packets that are setting the speed. Uh, there was a lot of pitfalls to all this. Obviously, we just, all this was like 99% fail, and you know, it took us a long time to uh, get these things working. One, That's why it took us so long to get this talk together, because yeah. it was mostly failure. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to get any sort of successes. Uh, it really was, and we're, and we're incompetent. Like, if we had someone who knew anything about cars or electronics, I'm sure it went very smoothly. Because, um, you know, when you think about electronics and car attacks, like, Web browser exploit developers, that's exactly what you want to <laughs> That's why you want to do this type of work. Uh, thanks, DARPA. Uh, 
really, you're not gonna, we found that you can't really ruin these ECUs unless you're reflashing them. Uh, a lot of the times I'd panic and be like, oh my God, I burnt the ECU out by hooking a wrong wire up. And in all reality, you know, I just knocked a wire out and it wasn't working. We found they're quite resilient. Uh, you know, you can hook power up to any of the pins and it doesn't really blow up. Um, so if you think that you ruined the ECU, I'd triple check your wiring. Uh, I'd call Charlie all the time, like, dude, it doesn't work anymore. Everything's, everything's broke. Everything's broke, we're screwed, we're Sometimes not gonna do this. Sometimes you would order a new one. I did order a new one, it cost us $1,000. Well, not us, but someone $1,000. Uh, because I thought it was broken, in all reality, wire was loose. Oh no, I burned out an alligator clip. The, 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 the actual wire broke. But still, the point is you're not gonna ruin the ECUs. They're very tough. Yep. They may send okay messages. Everything may look okay, uh, but it's not. Um, these are just things you're gonna have to figure out. Uh, you're gonna have to hook sensors up. You're gonna have to do a lot of debugging, troubleshooting. Wiring, uh, as you see, this is very easy to understand, very easy to debug, right? It's just a mess. Uh, I'm sure there's better ways to do this, but we're idiots. And when something goes wrong, it's, it's just so hard to know where to start to figure yeah. out what's wrong. So when, when an ECU doesn't work anymore, uh, looking at this doesn't really help you out. And I wasn't smart enough to take notes or label anything. So uh, yeah, it's just a disaster. All right, same here. So like all of a sudden, one day something stops working and this is what you had to start with. You come down to your bench after being away for a week and you're like, oh man, something doesn't work. Oh, right there it is, right? It's the, you don't know, like, it's just a wreck. Uh, what, did I mention wiring? You should probably check your wiring. Uh, alligator clip came loose and I was like, goat cart doesn't work anymore. I broke it. Nope, alligator clip came loose, you know? So uh, I panic a lot. So I think we, we, we accomplished what we set out to do, which is to make car research Affordable. So this is like some of the prices of what ECUs cost. I told you I bought this GM uh, head unit for a couple hundred bucks. Uh, some of these other ones, you know, 200 bucks for the, the engine control module, 150, 50 dollars. The new ones, of course, cost more. Yeah. Um, it's better if you can get them used. This is the one you buy when you're panicked and you want to meet your last milestone, right there. That'll cost you 1,100 bucks. Now it's sitting in a box on your shelf. It's <laughs> sitting in a box. Uh, you know, this isn't perfect, but we really wanted to lower the bar. We wanted people to start looking at ECUs, looking at ECU security, and I think we at least give you a blueprint on what to do. Right. So in a perfect world, you have 10 vehicles and you can test them and tear them apart however you, you want. Yeah. But in the real world, you don't. So this is the best, the second best thing. And I think the real lesson to learn from this story is DARPA bought us two cars and two go-karts, and that equals suck it, gruck. Uh, you know, we got the cars and the go-karts and you got nothing, so sweet. He's sleeping, he's not even fucking here. Yeah, Grug was, was what was it, he tweeted about like when DARPA had this yeah. project. Hey, why don't you buy me a car? Yeah, he's like, hey Mudge, why don't you buy me a car? And like Charlie and I were chuckling because we got an approval of our cyber fast track already. Couldn't wait to rub his face in it. It was awesome. It was, it was great, it was the best thing ever. That's it for us. Anyone got any questions? Yeah. I, I also, thank you for waking up early, coming to the talk. Thanks Thomas, thanks everyone. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for this informative and very entertaining presentation. I was wondering, Thanks. the software framework in which you injected these uh, CAN messages, is that available? We'll... Yes, yeah, so we released that. Um, I don't know if the, the site, do you know the exact name? If you search, if you search car hacking the content, the first link's going to be IOActive's blog, and it has the link to the big zip file with all our stuff. Yeah, so we, we have a white paper. It's like 100-something pages, and also the tools. Uh, the, the, the scripts, all the framework, it's all there. So just Google for us. If you can't find it, send us an email or tweet us, and we will make sure you get it. So when you're changing the uh, speedometer, it's like, is that actually going to affect the acceleration of the car? Will we be able to make it actually go faster? It's like, or is it just showing, displaying the, uh, the change of the speed? So what we showed there was just showing it, but we were able to affect the acceleration of the Toyota. Yeah, in the Toyota, you could send CAN messages that would actually affect acceleration. In the videos, it was just changing the speed, but you could perform the same attack by, you know, you wouldn't actually be accelerating on the bench, but I'm sure you could work something up. Yeah, so so the, it's two different messages, one for the, to set the speed on the speedometer, and one to actually affect the speed. So the best way to kill someone in a car is a Toyota Prius, then, correct? Uh, yeah, for research, go, go research ahead purposes that. only. Okay, yes. Cool. It might not be the easiest car to hack, but it's the only one that has fully published exploits available. <laughs> so uh, now you've spent all this money, uh, are you the reason that America can't have health care? Uh, Jesus Christ once said, what? The poor is what health care? Shut it all down. And then we did that in the United States. That's my answer to that. Uh, I will say that 
the United States is known for cutting edge research and we are just forwarding that on. Were you able to do anything with the microphone um, in this setup? I don't, we never messed with the microphone. Yeah. It's, it's possible, I would guess, yeah, but we I'm, never I'm did. Sure you could. Yeah. So I, we should say, so other researchers before us who did some, some similar research, they did turn on the microphone and listen, listen to uh, traffic. And they did it remotely as well. So it's definitely possible. We didn't do it, though. How easy is, is it to blind or remove messages while you are in flight or just change them to send some wrong values or stuff like that? How, how hard is it? Yeah. So uh, it's, it's super easy to send messages. You can't intercept and change messages. Um, but what you, what the way our attacks would work, like setting the speed, the car is sending messages all the time to set the speedometer. Um, so we send messages to set it to a different value. And the reason that it picks our value over theirs is we send them much faster. So, uh, so you're dosing it? You're yes. just dosing it? Yes, yes. So we just we flood the network with, with the message we want, and it ignores the, the, the messages that are there already. So you can overwhelm existing messages, but you can't change them. They're still there. The protocols over the CAN network, were they similar for other, the, all the sensors? Or I'd assume the protocols would be different for different sensors. They're different very, sensors. very proprietary. The Ford was completely dissimilar than the Toyota, which I'm sure is dissimilar than a Mercedes, which is dissimilar than a BMW. They, they're, they kind of pride themselves on having proprietary messaging. Uh, it can actually be different between the same make and model of car. Like a 2006 Prius had different messages than our 2010. And were they all encrypted or like plain text? No. Uh, encryption, there's no encryption on CAN messages. Um, You've got to remember, too, that adds a lot of overhead. So they need things to work fast. You, you know, and airbag deployment can't be a millisecond late. It needs to happen right away. So there's really no encryption overhead uh, capable. Encryption not working, no airbags. Yeah, exactly. But I thought you said the CAN protocol is the standard protocol used by the car industry, right? It, it is. So, it, you know, every message is going to be anywhere from zero to eight bytes. Uh, of data, oh, right. oh, that so, application okay. data is going to be proprietary per car, per manufacturer. Right. Okay. right. So it's the higher. So yeah, it's like saying, you know, TC. Everyone uses TCP, but the actual like, you know, higher application level is all totally nice. random proprietary stuff. All right. Uh, the sub answer. There's a thing called J1939 that heavy machinery uses, like uh, trucks and um, like, yeah, it's like big rigs. They've all agreed on standard sets of application data messages. So if you figure this stuff out for a big rig, it's going to work for a Merck, Volvo. Uh, Freightliner, Mac, whatever. Awesome. awesome. So, yeah, if you pop a truck, you can pop a lot of trucks.